Welcome, everyone. Howdy. My name's AJ. And I'm Josh. Welcome to Conversation Quest. Today, we're going to discuss right to repair, open source software and hardware, basically open source all the things. That's our goal. Absolutely. So open source software um, is going to be something we're going to get more into, but it's really just making things available to modify and repair. And while that seems like an obvious thing, historically we've had that ability, uh, modern companies are making it harder and harder to actually repair what you own. You mean right to repair, that is? Yes. I think you started by saying open source is that. No, open source is absolutely, a, it's a matter of right to repair. Fair because enough. you have the software code and you can fix it. So it is the software and occasionally hardware uh, approval for right to repair. Fair enough. So yeah, typically, um, it for those who aren't familiar, um, it may seem silly that we even need to discuss this. Um, can you can you repair? Do you have the right to repair um, something you buy? Let's say you you buy a car, right? Two thousand five Honda Accord, uh -huh. and your you hit a curb, your tire blows, and your your rims busted. Yeah. You just go to a mechanic, you get that fixed, right? Well, in many ways, the car industry is the automotive industry has kind of been ahead of the curve um, with third party products and things like that. In the electronic world, which is quickly becoming the Internet of Things everywhere, everything's electronic now. Companies have been fighting a lot harder to either prevent that altogether or essentially make your right to repair still exist. However, the actual function of going to get that device repaired, much, much harder. And that's what we're going to dive into. Yeah. Um, so there's been a long time where certain cars weren't allowed to be repaired outside of the dealership, unless it void your warranty. And in fact, that changed far more recently than anyone is aware of. Um, the 1990 Clean Air Act required all vehicles built after 1994 to include an onboard computer system to allow or to monitor emissions. Um, and it also required automakers to provide independent repairers the same emissions service information as provided to the franchised new car dealers. So before 1990, car industry, car companies could be like, you can only get your stuff serviced at our facility through our certified mechanics. Um, so, and that's, the, as he said, the car industry has been ahead of the curve. Yeah. Other companies <laughs> are still doing this. Yeah, it seems wild. I mean, most people, if you just ask them on the street, like, oh, your, I see your iPhone screen's broken. Um, are you going to get that fixed? Like, do you, are you allowed to get that fixed? They'd be like, what are you talking about? Am I allowed to? It's mine. Having no idea that um, Apple especially is one of the worst violators of the right to repair ethos. Uh -huh. um, so if you bring your iPhone to like iFix and they're not a certified like that specific one isn't certified. You lose right. your warranty. Yeah. Um, some computer companies like Staples you still offers computer like software service. If you bring it to that, that can void your warranty. Yeah, depending on the manufacturer of that computer, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh -oh. I didn't Oh. We oh. good? Yeah, we're good. Okay. <laughs> um yeah, for, for those who want to follow after this conversation, um, Lewis Rossman does really good work on explaining this and giving examples. Um, he's on YouTube. Uh, Gamers Nexus has done some high-quality videos on it. Um, God, what was that guy's name? Um, the Tesla Salvager, are you familiar with him? No. Tell me more. Uh, uh, I've been listening to him. Over the past few days, because we've been trying to do this podcast for a couple days, but life happened and um, I was hurting a lot because of XLH and I think Josh had one thing come up, but uh, I've been 
over the past few days digging into um, Rich Benoit or Rich Benoit um, is his name. He on YouTube, he's Rich Rebuilds and he for a long time basically exclusively refurbished Teslas. Um, he's recently got into other things, but um, that's a really good follow. Um, he started out by he really wanted a Tesla once he got in one and, and was able to drive one, but he couldn't afford it. So he found like auction sites. He spent like $15,000 on a Tesla that um, was in a huge flood. Um, the water came out all the way up to almost the driver's neck. Oof. Um, and they totaled the car because of that. So he bought that car and he couldn't get anybody to look at it. Um, and he called Tesla thinking like, oh, I'll just buy the motor and, you know, I'm a, I'm a gearhead, I'm a wrench head, I'll buy the motor, I'll buy the battery from Tesla and I'll do it myself. And Tesla kind of laughed at him and said, no, absolutely not. You're yeah. going to kill yourself. We're not giving you this. Um, and that's kind of what started his journey down that road. He eventually got that built, rebuilt. And, um, as far as I know, still has it and still drives it. And it cost him total, like, I think it was like 40 grand. Um, and it was a Model S, so it was like a hundred thousand dollar car new. Yeah. Um, anybody else you can think of? Um, going back to Apple, um, oh, one yeah. of the things. Now, this is kind of why the right to repair is so important. Um, so proprietary parts make it hard to repair certain things, mm -hmm. obviously. However, um, a lot of companies use it as a way of pushing new product. Um, sure. Just. And as you mentioned before, Apple's one of the big ones. One thing that, um, so the right to repair, as I said, voids your warranty and they'll make it so you can't necessarily get aftermarket parts. Like yeah. they probably won't confiscate your stuff, but you're still in a position wherein you, you kind of can't use the product. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that they do is they also uh, aggressively void warranty over certain uses. Yeah. So the to right to repair. Outside of their... Sorry, yeah. go ahead. Well, for example, um, as of, as early as 2009, if you smoked around your Apple products, it voided the warranty. <laughs> I did yeah. not know about that one. Yep. <laughs> so, and that's one of those things that, like, the right to repair, say, you know, say I work for, you know, this little company doing repairs... Apple's making their money selling new iPhones yeah, and Macs. So you bring in your PC for me to repair it. I'm a Mac certified repair station, but I'm also not aware that you've been smoking. They're going to do the test and be like, oh, no, you smoked around it, voided warranty. We're not going to cover it. Saving mm -hmm. them money. So me being a smaller you know, company, I can't do those tests. Right. So... And, and that's part of the whole thing why they're trying to protect the right to repair as a bad thing. You, you shouldn't have it. It's their product. Yeah. They're, um, I have some notes here too. They, uh, they're, Josh just mentioned the like third party repair certification process for Apple. Uh -huh. Um, one of the requirements for that is you have to agree to unsolicited and un unknown um, inspections of your inventory to make sure that you have nothing that Apple deems as uncertified or uncertifiable, unqualified, yeah, competitive in any way, basically. Um, and let's say that Josh and I were to open a store and we went through the process, you know, it's probably a couple thousand dollars, I'm not sure, yeah, to get certified. If we did that and we were certified, but then let's say, you know, two years from now or something like that, we decided, you know what, screw this program. We don't want any part of it anymore. We're, we're done doing it. Um, in that agreement that we initially signed, as it's written, as I understand it, you have to agree to those inspections for up to five years after you leave the program. So imagine like any other circumstance where that would somebody like some legal team would say that that's okay right you you bought your car from honda 
you paid it off. It's not a lease or anything like that. But then Honda shows up at your doorstep four years later and says, we need to go in your garage and make sure you don't have any parts from, you know, Rock Auto or something like that, that we didn't certify. Yeah. It's absurd. Absolutely. And I understand the concern. And this is how they get away with it. They say that they have a legitimate concern that users will put in subpar quality uh, components that can damage the product further. Sure. Um, so they can't warranty those, which sure. is a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. um, I was telling AJ, you know, there was a YouTuber who blew six cameras, I think, using aftermarket batteries. Now we're talking like Sony, you know, A3 series or A2 series. Mm -hmm. Like they're they're higher end cameras. Right. You know, $1500 video setup. So there is a genuine concern and there's also a safety concern cuz like especially with cars, you put in an aftermarket part that's, you know, sub quality, it can lead to people being hurt. So, and they lean on this saying it's a public safety concern. Mm -hmm. And yeah, sure. Cars, maybe, maybe. But I think that winds up just being a matter of the liability for the parts person. A lot, yeah. you know, a lot of warranty issue. Yeah, it'd be the, the person who installed that. That's part of your, as a business, your liability insurance. and Or, or who manufactured that, you know, cheap component. Yeah. Yeah, if you bought it from like Panasonic versus, um, Halley Express, uh, Wish some some yeah some no name company on Wish or AliExpress. Yeah, and those companies should have those, um, some protections against that kind of stuff. You, you know, if you open the device and you pour coffee all over it, and it's electronic device, and you did that while it was plugged in, and you did it on purpose, and you took out the caps and you put in some AliExpress special caps and you know you weren't able to do it and you tore the traces off the board and you sent that back and tried to get Apple to pay for 100% of that and everything. Yeah, it's obviously a different story. Yeah. Yeah. But the right to repair really just applies to, you know, people at you know independently certified facilities largely. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, we should be able to fix our stuff. And yeah. I think there definitely needs to be a line that can be walked. Sure. Um, and I think in stuff like that, modularity and making it so that things like, oh, the screen can be replaced. Because mm -hmm. that's that should be an easy fix. I've seen people do it tons of times. I've done it on my own, yeah. Yeah, it, it's not a difficult fix. Yeah, and in many cases, it's not. Um, some cases, the manufacturer specifically makes it really difficult and they require proprietary tools and uh -huh. then you you know a place like you break i fix or something like that some small repair shop may have those tools but the average individual is not going to have those no. but like i replaced the screen in my my lg um my lg g5 i replaced the screen um i th think i replaced the screen in one other device one other phone um but I mean, I, I took that risk that that phone I bought off of Swapo, which is like a third party. Yeah. Um, gently used thing. So there was no warranty on that anyway. Um, but like my YouTube channel makes and mods is built around repairing and refurbishing video game consoles and like making other things. But that's, that's a huge thing. It, those warranty voided for move stickers. I don't know if I have anything around me. Um, that I could show you. But basically on any electronic device or anything else, you've probably seen one. Yeah, the warranty, warranty voided for, void move. for move. Yeah. Usually hides a, a screw or something like that. Um, or it's a roll of essentially a tape along a seam that's like, hey, you, you do this. And... Yeah, or on like um, on consoles, for example, on the PS3, there's a sticker that um, once you peel it, it says void. Yeah, it just leaves it stuck to the, the body. But, but but before that, it doesn't say void. Yeah. Um, those kind of stickers have actually been 
determined illegal since the 70s um, under the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. Yeah. Um, so simply opening your product is not supposed to void the warranty, but most people don't know that. So companies use that to say, oh, the warranty sticker is broken, even if it happened in transit or you dropped it and you know you dropped it on a rock or something. Uh, we don't have to service your product. And then it's your word against Apple's. Who do you think is going to win that? Yeah. And then you also have like weird things that bind to the software. And then the software binds to the hardware, which is what like Apple does. So like in agreeing to their iOS terms, which you have to agree to, mm -hmm. to use the software, it also means you're agreeing to use the hardware. And by violating the software terms, they can seize the hardware and vice versa yeah tesla is a really um tesla is a base basically becoming more and more like apple as time goes on it's really unfortunate because i'm a huge fan of of the idea of the teslas i'm a huge fan of i think they look really good um full disclosure i'm invested in the company um by no means is it a lot but i do have some shares um I'm a big fan of, of Elon Musk and what he's doing in many ways. However, um, specifically because of those reasons, in fact, I should be one of the people that's saying like, this is wrong. Um, and one of the things they'll do, which uh, that Rich Rebuilds guy talks about is there, there are chips in there and they can see essentially wherever the car goes at any time, you know, what's been open, all that kind of stuff. And if there's a, a specific sensor that goes off and they Tesla sees that, they'll blacklist your VIN number, uh -huh. um, which if they do that to you, you are no longer allowed to get official software updates um, and you are no longer allowed on their supercharger network. Which is insane. Their super, yeah, their supercharger network is a huge reason that you buy a Tesla. Um, so what he had to do is he had to find like a white hat hacker essentially to, um, install some third party software and he's able to get the updates and still able to use the superchargers, uh, Simone Yetz on, on YouTube. Uh, have you seen her truckla? No. So Simone Yetz is, um, I think she was initially part of one of those like uh adam savage um show type things like mythbusters or something i can't remember but she bought a model three and she had this wild idea to turn it into a truck so she lopped off the back half of the model three and she had a bunch of engineers working with her and like auto mechanics and stuff like that she had a really awesome team um and you can follow the videos on youtube they turned it into a model three sized pickup truck and it's amazing. Um, and she was really scared that, she, you know, she was going to get blacklisted or whatever. And she said she never did. She can still use the supercharger network and all that kind of stuff. But she thinks that part of that is because the videos blew up and like brought a lot of positive attention to the company mm -hmm. that they didn't want to like, do that to somebody who brought a lot of positive attention um that's her theory anyway but if it were just you or i who did that we and they had no idea who we were and we didn't post any videos there's a good chance that we'd get blacklisted once they saw the codes spinning off on their end oh yeah so so these are just some wild examples <laughs> yeah and what i hinted at in the beginning, which we'll get more into, is those white hat hackers shouldn't have to be needed. Um, th yeah. There should just be like, oh, these are the parts. Mm -hmm. And honestly, if the manufacturer sold the parts, then it, they'd still be making their money. Like, mm -hmm. service is service is the large majority of it. Yeah. And what's funny is companies. Companies also wind up getting hit with the right to repair problem. Um, not the smallest of which is McDonald's. 
um, McDonald's, like it's a running meme that the ice cream machines are down. Yeah. It's because it's a repair system. McDonald's gets hit with right to repair on that. There was a, there was a couple, I think they brought out a product that essentially bypassed the security on the, yes, they have security on the ice cream machines. <laughs> Shocking. And it, it spits out the codes and tells you specifically what it is. And very useful for a repair person, but not just for a repair person, but for the manager, the yeah. only people that can repair those machines, which you, there's a secret code to get into the diagnostic menus of the ice cream machines. <laughs> so dumb. It is. And it's because something like half of that company's money comes from the repair calls. Even though they're the exclusive dealer to McDonald's. Mm -hmm. Globally. 50% of their income comes from the repair calls. Which is nuts. That's wild. Yeah. Sorry, my allergies are bothering me. That's wild. Um, one thing that uh, plays into this uh, going back to Apple is... You mentioned that if uh, third-party repair people could get the parts, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. Yeah. Um, Apple is one of the companies who enforces it the most, where they will go to a company, you know, not... Uh, I'm just going to use this company as an example because most people may be familiar with it if they're familiar with semiconductor companies. But Taiwan Semiconductor is one of the biggest semiconductor companies. Apple will go to a company like that who they buy products from and they'll say, look, we want to buy $50 million of this one piece or 50 million um, pieces of this one piece. But if we do this, you cannot sell it to anybody else. Yeah. And that puts third party mechanics out of out of the loop uh, or third party technicians that puts the individual like you or I who could go buy like a Panasonic capacitor and solder it onto the board or whatever the case may yeah. be. Everybody's out of the loop except Apple. And that's not cool. It, and honestly, I think should be illegal. Agreed. Um. So it, during that time, I looked it up. So the device I was talking about for McDonald's is called the Kitch. The K it's K-Y-T-C-H. Okay. Um, so 90% of McDonald's in the U.S. feature an $18,000 ice cream machine made by a food equipment manufacturer, Taylor. Um, the other 10% have an Italian-made product. Um, about 85% of the franchises are uh, independently owned and operated. Which means someone is paying McDonald's fee to sell its products under its brand name. Um, the technician has to enter a secret code. Not so secret since uh, people have started leaking them. Yeah. Um, Kitch came in and it's a gadget that hacks into the inaccessible data. And all you have to do is plug it in. Uh, the process is reportedly as simple as requiring 20 minutes and a screwdriver. And it connects to the Wi-Fi and there's an app. That makes everything completely readable. Mm. Uh, Taylor, who makes the product, is going after McDonald's, and uh, McDonald's has told the franchise owners if you find if we find that they're installed on your ice cream machines, you lose your franchise. Oh, yeah. They literally take away your business. Yep. Um, That's and, amazing. And here's the thing. A lot of the time, now they just need to be inspected and cleaned every six months. Yeah, but like most things, like most things. Maintenance. But the cleaning requires you to actually hit a code. Like you actually have to like press a button. So of course, only the repair people can confirm that it's been cleaned. Is it like a basically just an update to let the the not software even. know that it was cleaned? Not even. It's more or less just go and press a button, say clean. Oh, so it's like a physical switch that will clean after you push the button? No, no, no. You clean it, and then you go in and you press the button saying, yep, cleaned. 
Like you're just clearing oh. the flag that says it's like you're dismissing it's the notification. Clean. That that's what I meant. That's what I meant by oh. like a software thing. Yeah. 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 Wow. Like there's no update. It's literally <laughs> just saying, yeah, it's been cleaned. That's wild. Yeah, I know somebody actually, um, when I worked for the healthcare system I used to work for, um, I taught so I, I worked in housekeeping. I taught the I designed the um program that we used to to teach all the housekeepers about the products we use and pathogens and all that. I designed that program and then I implemented it for the next couple of years. And one of the people that came through um was a manager or assistant manager at I don't remember some some fast food company but they had like ice cream machines and she said that a lot of times if she would go into the store like on her day off or something like that the ice cream machines were down and it wasn't because they didn't work it was because nobody wanted to clean it uh -huh. so they just told everybody it's down yep <laughs> yeah that happens a lot so but with mcdonald's especially and that's usually more typical and from what i understand that's more typical of like wendy's <laughs> Due to the nature of their machine, cleaning it is a little bit more involved. Um, and certain, like, the generic, like, soft serve ice cream machines are a pain to disassemble and clean. But McDonald's one is relatively easy. Because from what I understand, it... Because theirs actually keeps everything in chilled storage. Mm. So you don't need to clean it out every night. Nice. Um, so it, just like your freezer, it'll keep your ice cream fresh for a long time. And since it's a soft serve base, as long as it's running, it's not going to develop like ice crystals or anything. So arguably it can keep your ice cream fresher longer. Mm. So like, it's a good system. And does it justify the 18 grand over the lifetime of the machine? Probably with spoilage and having to throw out like, oh, this ice cream has crystals in it from being frostbit. Yeah. yeah people mm -hmm. are going to be pissed about that. But yeah, and sorry, go ahead. Service wise, like that's an insane amount of money to make from service. Yeah, you said it was 50% of their business model? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's huge. And to, to be clear, um, some people may be confused. Um, like you and I both agree that a huge company like that, arguably a monopoly in, in the case of um, Apple with certain pieces and things like that, or microsoft or whatever these super large multi-trillion dollar or multi hundreds of billion dollar companies um they shouldn't be allowed to like dictate who can get all of their parts in the repair world to be clear i'm not saying that apple or tesla or microsoft or whoever has to open all of their code to everybody and anybody can just use their code however they want and they have to tell everybody every single piece of every single software and hardware device and everybody has to 100 percent be able to replicate and all that kind of stuff that's not yeah. what i'm arguing and I i've never heard anybody in sort of the right to repair movement argue that we're just arguing for more openness on things like um physical or even software repair like um I know you've been involved in development and many things mm -hmm. um, on the software side. By no means am I a developer or anything like that, but I'm a big fan of tinkering and I always have been. So yeah. I've put third-party software on my consoles. I've put third-party software on my phones. And, you know, that's one reason why I don't buy Samsung products is because they lock that that out hardcore on all their devices. Yep. Uh, Tabby, my, my wife, we bought her... A tablet for work and it was over a thousand dollars for this tablet right uh -huh. and you cannot for whatever reason right click there's like they remove the right click feature in their software i thought it was a glitch or something i thought i was just like being dumb or whatever i went on the internet i did as much research as i thought reasonable at the time and user after user after user, technician after technician kept saying it's just not available in their software. So something as simple as that, if you were able to put a third-party ROM on, you could fix. 
Yeah. And I've done so on other devices, other phones and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's absurd. Like oh. we paid over a thousand dollars for this device and she's a huge Samsung fan. And she was like, she has to find some stupid workaround because they, they literally like removed a feature most people use. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is like, as I mentioned a while back with like the <laughs> having to hold certain companies responsible, like Rockstar and Bethesda for mm -hmm. re-releasing broken games without fixing it. Mm -hmm. We, I think we kind of start needing to need to hold these companies responsible for taking away features that like we use. Yeah. Just like, be vocal about it. You know? Yep. Removing the, the headphone port on, you know, your Apple phones was, was kind of mm -hmm. dumb like that. Why yeah. would you do NP everyone hated them for it. Granted, most of us now don't plug in headphones. We use earbuds, but at right. the same time, a lot of people can't. And yeah. Or if you have kids, you know, and you want to buy them a 10 or $20 set of skull candies. Yeah. And they're a kid. So they're going to wreck it in a week. And you can't use just regular earbuds because they'll lose it by the end of the yeah. day. <laughs> like you should be able to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of where we're leading to on the other half of the subject is uh, open source. Mm -hmm. On the other end is open source technology. And what that means is that the hardware or software, depending on what we're talking about, uh, is is documented and it is available and it's all explained in some yeah. way, shape or form. Um, one thing that used to be the it used to be the case on a lot of things, um, like back to the cars. Uh, Chilton, Chitlins, Chiltons, uh, they used to have car repair manuals. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I have heard of that. And you could, you could just go buy the repair manual and all the parts would be itemized and you could be like, oh, this is the problem. Check this. And this is how to do it. Mm. Um, and then like guitar amplifiers were the same way and radios and TVs, like you would open, you'd bring it to a repair guy and he'd know just, Okay. The circuit does this, or the circuit does this. Just replace, you know, this cap or this tube, and you're back in business. Mm -hmm. Um, open source is kind of an extension of that, where it's yeah. like they'll give you the whole uh, schematic, the whole diagram, and be like, "This is how it works." There you go. Yeah. Um, in that, for those who don't know, that's not something that like. Sony will say, oh, here you go, third party um, repair person or tech enthusiast. Yeah. Um, you can just come to us and here's all of our documentation. A lot of times it's enthusiasts who are just like, look, there's no documentation. I'm going to back engineer this. <laughs> yeah. And certain companies uh, still do it. Um, yeah. The, especially with like analog, like audio video gear. Um, Behringer has a line mixer and they have the schematic right on top of them or right underneath the mixer. Um, certain amp companies, like they show off their, their amp schematic on, on the thing, on That's the website, awesome. on the manuals, on everything. Um, they still own the patent on that schematic and what that mm -hmm. schematic builds, mm -hmm. but it's just publicly available. So you can be like, oh yeah, you can fix that. Go, go fix it. Yeah, and that patent would be to protect them against IP theft. Yeah. You know, every, everybody knows um, a country like China, um, especially with electronics, will just blatantly clone your device and sell it as their own. And that's the kind of stuff that they're they're trying to prevent yeah. by by still having the patent, but by opening um, opening the software or the the hardware schematics up. Um, another example, and one that I kind of found was really useful, um, especially in like as a content creator and musician, was um, PowerWorks. Uh, that's a company. I think they're owned by the same company that owns. Uh, they're part of Hanser and Davit, so they're owned by the same company that owns like BC Rich Guitars and stuff like that. Okay. They have the P PW4EX mixer. It is a four channel you know, microphone line level mixer. It's like a hundred bucks, something like that. And as I was reading through the owner's manual, which I'm pulling up right now, 
are apparently downloading right now. <sighs> or not. <laughs> there we go. Nope. Pause for technical difficulties. That's nah, not pulling up. But it has a full-on schematic and shows you how much uh, phantom power goes to each line. That's useful. Um, which which kind of made me go like, oh, it's not quite enough for my purposes, but that's really kind of cool. Yeah, like it tells be able you to check that on the fly. Or you can check it before purchasing it. You can make mm -hmm. an informed decision on what you're buying. Because I was like, man, I could use a little four port switch or a four port uh, mix board, and then just plug it into one of my ports on my, you know, my interface. Right. But I saw that and I was like, that's not enough phantom power. Hard pass. Yeah, so um, who was the company you mentioned? PowerWorks. P-O-W-E-R-W-E-R-K-S. So PowerWorks sounds like a, a good example of the simplicity that we're asking for, right? Um, the flexibility that we're asking for. Another one, at least in theory, they're a relatively new company, is uh, Frameworks Laptops. Uh -huh. Have you seen those? Oh, I'm pulling it up right now. So frameworks, um, the concept is dope. It's basically the most modular laptop that I've ever seen in any modern time. Um, one of the arguments against right to repair is, oh, you just want everything to be made with four Phillips screws and to be, you know, 12 inches thick. Um, oh, that's kind of sexy. And, yeah, they're really nice looking. Um, frameworks laptops look like any other modern laptop. I don't know if you want to throw them up on screen or Pulling I can, but, um, their, their company ethos is they literally put, um, QR codes on most of the pieces inside the laptop. So you can scan the QR code and it gives you instructions on what the piece is, the part number, um, even how to replace it. Um, they ship the laptop with a screwdriver that they make. The one end is a spudger, like a plastic spudger. The other end, um, I think it's an interchangeable bit end, um, which is like a quarter inch uh, shank mm -hmm. so that you can take it apart and and service it. Um, and of course, they have warranty service and all that. So if you don't want to do that, you don't have to. Um and they're committing to a certain amount of time for hardware support and software support and things like that. I'm going to um, toss it up on the screen right now. Awesome. So that's you can go on their, that. you can go on their website. Yeah, there you go. See all those QR codes. So you have like the battery, the Wi-Fi card, the hard drive, um, slot, bunch of different areas. And even the the bezels around the screen, it's just magnetic. So you just pop it off and you can buy a different color one and pop it on there. Um, they've also committed to essentially open source as much as you know they they think is reasonable. Yeah. So such that somebody with a 3D printer could um, print, like let's say um, the laptop isn't working for you anymore for the productivity you need to do for your business, but you don't want to throw it away. You can pull out the motherboard, take a 3D printer, build a 3D printed case, stick the motherboard in there and still get a socketable processor for them or something like that. Um, That's awesome. To, to have like your own, you know, gaming console that now you, um, you bought a new chip, a new motherboard or a new CPU from frameworks, but you don't need the old one. Uh, so they're a great example of that. I know Fairphone is supposed to be like reasonably modular, but they're more on the software side from what I understand. Yeah. Um, who are some other ones? There's a lot of it. Um, one example that I can remember um, off the top of my head is so a few years, a few years ago, many years ago at this point, uh, there was a product called the Raspberry Pi, and it was an affordable mm. computer. Um, a lot of people were like, oh, it's going to run Linux. How open source are we talking here? You know, is it open source hardware? And they're like, 
as much as we can. Certain parts of it aren't, like the Broadcom chip. Mm. So another company um, so you have other companies that are full on open source um, like BeagleBone BeagleBoard uh, stuff. Yeah. Yep. Is all open source. Everything, everything there. Uh, from the chip and how the chip operates, all the instructions and how essentially a diagram of what is on the chip, all the way through all the stuff is available publicly. Just go buy it if you wanted. You could make if you had the ability and the hardware to manufacture, you could make a a beagle bone. Hmm. Yeah, that's another company I forgot about, but uh yeah, that's fantastic. And these companies are proving that this business model is one that will work. Uh -huh. Right? It's it's currently working. There's been companies like this for ages. Um so a lot of the arguments against right to repair like um, the safety argument we already discussed and the sort of thickness and like Phillips screws to open kind of arguments. Yeah. The, um, it's going to be a, a lower clunkier version. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, they're just, they're either made by people who don't really understand the effects of this, or maybe people who are not tinkerers themselves, or they're made oftentimes by the companies uh, to try and keep market share. They're just not made in good faith. Yeah. And there is something to be said because like software is another place. Open source is really taking off because you don't need to move a physical product. Like right. at least with open with closed source hardware, you can justify like, Oh, there's a thing that I have to make that's physical. And you know, if other people knock it off, then it costs me money. Mm hmm. But software, you know, one copy or a billion copies, it's going to cost the same thing, arguably. Yeah, outside of, like, storage space. <laughs> and electricity, yeah. But, I mean, yeah. if I sell one copy, it co it saves me, you know, it, you know, I sell one copy of my program, my app. Mm. It's all the storage space is on everyone else's computer as they download it. Right. It doesn't yep. cost me any more storage space. You're just duplicating from that one exactly. file, essentially. Yeah. Um, so people are like, well, how are these companies that do open source stuff making money? They're just charities, right? Oh well, no. Like you have uh, Red Hat, who makes a ton of money in in corporate stuff, not only by making third party apps, mm. like uh, their software suites for office and production and network control, but also in training and education. Mm hmm. And I think that's really important to remember is you can make a profitable enterprise off of selling stuff like this. Yeah, for sure. Don't they make a distro too? Yeah. Um, Red Hat Linux yeah. is a, it's, you actually pay for a license. It's free to download, but mm -hmm. for support, you have a license and it, it's one of the best corporate Linux distributions you can use. They also own the free Fedora Project, okay. so. I didn't know that. Yeah, they own Fedora. Nice. Um, SUSE and OpenSUSE, oh, they're the same product, but one is just designed for corporate. Um, you also yeah, have you... CentOS, which is part of the Fedora Red Hat community, which is their server based. Yeah, I was going to say, you see this a lot. Um, most people, even if you're not familiar with a lot of what we're discussing now, you'll see this on your on your phone, your Android phone, your iPhone. Um, if you just go into the App Store, you'll see like uh, I can't remember the name of that. Car. Oh, Torque. Mm -hmm. Torque is a basically like a Bluetooth app that you can use to get diagnostic codes from your car, right? Well, they make a free version and they make a paid version. Yeah. Um, you see this a lot with software, and there are. A myriad of ways you can make money still doing this i have a um a cousin who is a professional locksmith he owns his own business and he and i have talked about like 
what should qualify as you know trade secrets right yeah um and he's brought up the fact that like there are many companies in his area um even some larger companies who come to him specifically in his business specifically for the technologies and the experience that they have that maybe another locksmith in the the area doesn't have um so when he's training somebody uh like a new hire he wants to protect that part of the business right fair enough makes sense yeah um but what we consider a trade secret he and i um have gone back and forth about um because i argued to him and i don't know much about picking locks or anything like that but i argued that i imagine like in most businesses much of what you're teaching a new hire is not trade secrets no um you're teaching them bakes basic stuff that any other locksmith or any other housekeeper or any other coder would have to learn in their respective field and that you simply calling that a trade secret is kind of shitty and um we were discussing that in the context of one of my wife's former employers and a uh, non-compete agreement she had to sign to get hired and um you know we spoke to some lawyers and stuff after she no longer worked there and found out that non-compete agreements are basically just scare tools um they're almost never held up in court um because they're they're written incredibly broadly yeah um we run into that in a similar way with hardware and software restrictions from these major companies oh yeah a lot of them if they were taken to court would not hold up like those warranty voided for move stickers but if the average end user doesn't know that because people aren't talking about it or you know whether they don't they don't know themselves or they want to hide it or obscure it um the average end user is not going to know so the laws just are there to protect you know the people who don't really need it or don't need it as much <laughs> yeah And and that's the thing is, those those non compete things feel a lot like closed source employment mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, yeah. Because, because her specifically, sorry, go ahead. Because in a way, if you get to a certain level of uh, specialization, like, so you sign a non compete, and your job was building controller boards for surface to air missiles, right? Mm. Which, that is not done by the military. That is done by defense contractors. You have three companies. You have a skill set that is good at three companies. Mm -hmm. If you sign a non-compete and they try to enforce it, you're out of work. Yeah. Depending on how they write that, absolutely. And that was one of the things we ran into with her because that company, um, her non-compete was that she could not work at anyone... At any other company that they deemed competition but they never defined in the contract what competition meant yeah um she could not work anywhere they deemed competition for two years um so that means if that were to hold up in court which we were assured by at least two different lawyers at two different firms that it would so never hold never. up in court no um she, my wife would be out of work she yeah. wouldn't be able to work for two years in that field that she has a degree in. Yep. Um, and that's absurd. Yeah, and especially like imagine if someone tried to do that and it was like a um, hospital. You cannot yeah. work at hospitals. Yeah, she. I mean, she works in. She's a physical therapist assistant, so she works in healthcare. And by how they written the contract, which I read, it was thirteen pages long. Um, I read over it several times and discussed it with those two different lawyers. Yeah. Um, they could have easily argued that a hospital was competition. Absolutely. And that's the thing is like, especially in things like medical where, you know, it's saving lives. The concept of there being a trade secret is ludicrous as far as I'm concerned. In many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, but yeah. Another thing I, I just thought of going back to um, Apple, one of the most popular 
uh, tech tubers on YouTube is Linus Tech Tips. Typically does like PC related stuff. Um, he had a video series. I think there was three videos in the series a couple years back where he had one of the Mac um, desktops. One of the all in ones. Mm -hmm. um, and something on it broke. Now it's been a while since I watched it. But he contacted Apple to get it repaired and they refused to repair it. And it wasn't like a, um, I think he dropped it. I think it was a screen and he dropped, he broke the screen and he was upfront about it. He wasn't trying to hide anything. It's all documented. Um, they initially, I think it was, they said they would repair it, but they didn't have the parts at the time. So he went looking for the parts and he was able to find the parts online. Um, and he's like, look, I can get the parts in a day or what, whatever it was. Um, could I bring you the parts? Um, they said no, because they weren't, it was, they weren't purchased from an Apple certified place. Yep. Um, then eventually they refused to fix it at all, whether they got, were able to get the parts or not. And they told him at one point that the repair would be like three grand or four grand, something crazy when the parts that he was looking to buy were like a grand at most, something Oof. like that. A new one, buying a brand new version of that was this was less than their repair charge. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think he eventually repaired it himself or somebody on the team repaired it. But, uh, that's even a huge YouTuber who was like, I don't remember initially if he was like trying to be undercover and like not throw his name around, but he eventually made the videos and got publicity. And I mean, as far as I know, nothing in their business model and Apple's business model has changed. Oh no. And they won't. And that's the thing, is until until more open uh, solutions come to market, they're not going to. And until those open solutions can compete in such a way that it breaks the it breaks the hold that the consumer has, the brand loyalty, then yeah, part of it is. Um, legislation is really hard to pass because um, a lot of the legislators, like if you watch any of um, the people who've gone to testify on right to repair, mm -hmm. uh, I believe Lewis Rossman is one of them. The people are, are completely lost. Like these are 50, 60, 70 year old people who are like, so uh, my, my app on my phone, if I get my new phone, my app's not there. Uh, uh, can you fix that? You know, like, <laughs> these are the type of responses they have. They have no idea how any of this works. And yeah. uh, obviously, a lot of them are paid by some of these major corporations to lobby against such bills. Yeah. But they don't even understand how this stuff works. And those are the people making the laws. Um, and in fact, right now, the Senate is introducing a bill to allow farmers to fix their own farm equipment, which yeah, is kind of why Deere. we decided to, uh, dive into this. Um, because as weird as it sounds, um, the farming industry has actually gotten a lot less, uh, more towards the open source, whereas like software has been adapting and taking on open source stuff and like, oh, we don't need closed source solutions and phones. We're getting open for source phones and you know, electronics. But the people who are the most prone to being able to fix stuff, the most DIY people are getting that right taken away from them. Yeah. Like, I don't yeah, want to say Deere. conservative, but the most traditional, the most the uh, self-sufficient, the the backwoodsiest kind of people are the ones that, you know, have that motive to be like, I'm gonna just fix it, and now they're not being able to. 
Yeah. I mean, think about it. If you're a farmer, right, and you, whether you're a large farmer or a small farmer is kind of irrelevant, but let's say you have a tractor and a lot of these, a lot of farmers, their business may make what seems like a lot of money, but a lot of that's gross and what they're actually netting to the bottom line is not a lot of money and they can't afford to have, you know, if you're out in some rural location, they can't afford to have this huge, I mean, some of these John Deere tractors, and I'm sure some other brands, uh, John Deere just oh, happens yeah. to be one of the most popular. Ferrari makes tractors. They're, um, they're business, uh, building size. Like some of these things are ginormous. So you got to pay to get it towed and you may have to pay to get it towed an hour and then maybe they don't have the part. So now you got to wait two weeks or three weeks to get the part and then a week to get it repaired and then towed another hour back to your house. You're talking yeah. thousands and thousands of dollars just to fix the stupid thing. And then that's however many days you can't run your business the same way you were running it before. So you're losing money then. And that's specifically done by a company like John Deere on purpose to lock you out. Um, I was listening to, I think it was, yeah, it was an MKBHD podcast about right, right to repair. Um, and specifically about John Deere tractors and things like that. And there, a lot of their tractors have cell service. So if there's an error code that the tractor picks up on, it'll send that error code to John Deere. Yeah. So you, you may not even know because you're riding the thing along doing whatever you're doing or maybe you're taking a break. John Deere knows about the code before you do. And it's not even something that you could prevent. You couldn't even say like, because a lot of the codes will um, completely stop the tractor from running. So you can't even say like, you know what, I'm going to take the risk. I bought this thing. I really need to get this done today. If I just ignore it like a check engine light in a car, yeah, it'll be okay. No, in a lot of situations, you can't do that because once that code is triggered, it shuts off the tractor and you can't restart it until that code is cleared. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, earlier I mentioned the 1990 uh, thing that made it so that, you know, there was a little bit more uh, transparency in what was available to, um, like, garages. However, that only made that available. They could still be, like, warranty refused. Like, yeah. there was still a lot of stuff that, that could uh, go wrong. Um, it was only uh, in 2012 where they over came that hurdle and were like no you cannot void their warranty if they go to a licensed mechanic like no <laughs> in 2012 uh, 2012 10 years ago that's absurd um and here's the thing that only uh, that only applies to cars and trucks and i believe only consumer cars and trucks so tractors which is why the farmers are having this problem tractors don't see that incubators that they use to help bring their chickens to life don't see that so yeah you know it's a whole problem that's still going on yeah you mentioned um we discussed a little bit earlier the healthcare sector um i worked in healthcare for 13 years so when i hear incubator i immediately think of um yep. the babies that i saw yeah, in NICU. incubators yeah yeah nicu which i worked in um on and off many times um and i mean a lot of these babies in the nicu were born to to drug addicted mothers and would not survive outside of the nicu um for a certain period of time and or they have some super rare genetic disorder and would not survive outside of that incubator yeah for a certain period of time right well i'm not aware of any specific examples of this but i could easily think of just by looking at how those things were built there could be one particular part that doesn't work on there and if company x is the one you bought that from and company x has a deal like apple where they um, prevent any other manufacturer from having access to that part i mean you're literally talking about life and death for babies yeah and that's not a stretch absolutely it's not I'm not attempting to straw man the argument here. This is an example from real my life, past, my past. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. 
And if they were to go after competitive like companies, like say just a filter, right? Just mm-hmm. a circular air filter mm-hmm. for those things. There's there's nothing stopping it. There's there's nothing stopping the making of that. But if they're like, you can't use those filters because they don't have our chip on them mm-hmm. approving it, then like what you know that that does damage the lives of people and yeah. it could be that that company as we saw recently can't manufacture right now so you might only have third party alternatives mm-hmm. yeah i have um i can think of another example uh that i've dealt with personally so i've mentioned a few times on the podcast that i have a super rare condition called xlh it's X-linked hypophosphatemia. Um, as treatment for this disease, because there is no cure, something I was born with, and it ain't going away. <laughs> as treatment, I get a shot once a month. Okay, this shot is fifty thousand dollars a month. Okay, thankfully, I'm not paying that. Okay, I'm not paying fifty thousand dollars a month. Most humans, including me, could not afford that. Um, but as a requirement for this thing, I had to prove that I have the condition, right? By a genetic test, which you could argue makes sense because the company doesn't want to waste such an expensive drug on somebody who doesn't even have the condition. Um, but I'm also required to either have a nurse inject it or now that I have a different healthcare insurance, Um, I have to go to an on-site location, right? And these on-site locations are limited by, from my understanding, by the company, the manufacturer who makes this drug. So where I live, thank you, or thankfully there's one close by, but what if there weren't, right? What if I lived in a super rural location, this drug that is only allowed to be shipped through certain pharmacies Last I heard was like four or five different pharmacies. Nobody else is allowed to deal with this drug. Um, Thankfully, if I go without this drug, it's not life threatening. Um, It causes me a lot more pain, but I'm not going to die from it. Um, Now imagine a drug like insulin, right? Or a drug, um, some some, I don't know, some drug for the heart or something like that. Imagine if that, like, that you hear horror stories all the time of people who don't have access to that medication for some stupid reason, the insurance didn't want to cover it, or uh, the drug manufacturer, like in my case, will only ship it through certain pharmacies. What if that pharmacy is closed? Yeah. Like, these are, it goes from trivial stuff to like, oh, you have to be you know, trivial, you have to be without your phone for a day, all the way to like, you can't live anymore. <laughs> because this medication can't, you can't achieve this medication, or you can't reach this medication. Yeah, and and that's the thing, like, certain medicines, like, specifically yours, there's an understanding that there there's not a huge market for it. So it's not going to be made a lot. Right. There's only so, about 9,000 people. No, it was 12,000 people in the U.S. Yeah. So obviously it's going to be a little pricey. Yeah. But there's there's no reason for it to be 50 grand. And the fact that only like one company makes it and can only be handed through certain things. Medicine, yeah, ge- medicine should be open source. Generics need to exist. And that's sure. exactly what generics are, is they're yeah. the result of open science, open source uh, medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we say they're- stuff like open source and right to repair, and how how are they the same thing, and how do they apply to non-technology things, that's how. Yeah. Um, and these are, these are not like... Um, you know, fringe new ideas like NFTs or something like that. Yeah. This is like you probably take a medication 
if you take any medication that is a generic, whether you know it or not. Or you've had the the option of it. Yeah. Now, does the brand necessarily make the difference? That's that's something to be argued. Other, you know, that's like sometimes. You know, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, no. Most of the yeah. time, no. If it's you know chemically the same thing, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But at the same time, there's no reason why, like, insulin should cost as much as it does. There's, because you should be able to get it generic. And it yeah. should be something that you're not having to worry about people coming and suing you for your specific process on how to make. Yeah, I mentioned um, allergies earlier. I have severe allergies, and I have to carry EpiPens everywhere I go. Um, EpiPens, if you've ever tried to get one, are typically hundreds of dollars if not more per pen and they're only one time use and they expire shockingly fast yeah it's a couple months i think it's like six months um but there was a story in the news many years ago at this point of a kid you know i believe he was like early 20s who made um insulin or not insulin a uh, epinephrine injection for like three dollars yeah and that's the thing is like there's no reason for it to be <laughs> anything other than and and how does this work with you know the right to repair because that's mm -hmm. what we're doing is we're, we're repairing our body sure and we we have the right to repair our body and as the iot grows and technology uh, expands into the future we're going to have more i mean like it or not we're going to have more chips in our bodies yeah. we're going to have more what you would think of as traditional right to repair parts yeah and you're you know, going to start get... well not just that but you're going to start seeing like already we have legislation permitting and denying certain procedures mm -hmm. like not to get political but like abortion is a medical procedure sure. that you can argue um sure. getting less less political on that um Women in most states can't get their tubes tied without their husband's permission. That's a and and that's the thing is like hole. as we start to incorporate more and more technology into our body, legislation is going to come up on those parts. Yeah. And while we think it's our body, we get to choose. That's honestly a very uh, very male mindset because like the last two examples. Not everyone has that sort of right. Yeah. Um, and I mean, another uh, another thing related to that is uh, that specifically being worked on right now is Elon Musk's um, neural net chips. That he wants to literally implant a chip in your brain. Um, you yeah. think that that's going to have like some wildly open source software that makes you know a, a drastic change from everything else he's done i mean he's discussed making tesla software open source eventually yeah but right now it's tesla, not <laughs> yeah i mean he's opened a lot of and that's the thing with him it's a it's a coin flip because yeah. tesla owns patents that they have opened the like they're publicly usable patents and that's the other mm -hmm. thing you can patent something and still authorize people to use that patented uh, technology sure you just have the right to rescind that but like this yeah. their charging stations it's an open patent anyone can go make a tesla charger and that's beautiful mm. and a company could own the patent to making you know insulin mm. and be like all right anyone can make this but if you make it below our standard or you make it at such a low price point that it becomes suspicious then we have a right to remove the patent uh, uh, permission. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing um, that we're both passionate about is gaming, right? We mm -hmm. did a whole episode on gaming and um, something I'm sure we're going to talk about in the future. Uh, by the way, side note, none of the things we talk about are meant to be like a one and done kind of topic. No. <laughs> um, I don't know we if we mentioned that. But yeah, we will certainly revisit things. Um, 
we've mentioned in the past Nintendo and how, um, you know, you could argue essentially they're the Apple of the gaming world in many ways. They come after hardcore their IPs and uh, like PC ports of Mario 64 and things like that. So if a game ships broken, they could, the manufacturer of that game, could go after every single video about it, go after every single um, attempted fix by the community. Mm -hmm. Or what they could do and what some companies have done in the past is when they see community members fixing this and improving this and releasing mods and all kinds of stuff, they could hire them. Yep, and uh, Valve Software did that. Yeah, uh, I, I can't remember the specifics, but they did it relatively recently, like within the last few years, I believe. Oh yeah, um, everything from Portal, which Portal was just a, it was a mod that someone made, um, yep. to uh, Dota 2. Dota 2 think... was hired, the, the team was hired by Valve to make Dota 2 because they made the first Dota. I think there was even a more recent example from them, but uh, but yeah, those are two great ones. Oh yeah, they ha their hardware stuff. The people they hired for their uh, Steam machines and controllers. They looked at people who were making cool stuff in the communities and were like, yeah, we'll do this. That might be what I was thinking of. And that's kind of how to handle it. Mm -hmm. You can you can look at a community and see people fighting against your product that's going out. Or you can see people that are trying to make you have the best product on the market. Yeah. I mean, Nintendo is very protective of their IPs. They don't want, like, easily accessible versions of Mario, you know, doing yeah. inappropriate things with animals or obviously you know care like carrying nazi flags or something like that which yeah. i get it you know it makes sense but at the same time that's not the only thing they're going after no and you're never going to get rid of all that anyway nope. even if you wanted to so no. so punishing think, the, the few good operators yeah is, and I think uh, next week we'll probably be going into that more and more into mods and abandonware and stuff like that. Um, That'd be fun. Because that kind of falls logically into the next step of this is at what point is it you know a right to fix or is, and at what point is it fully transformative like the thing that was a whole product is now just a component of something greater. Yeah, especially as like system on a chips become the norm in more industries oh yeah um that beagle bone i mentioned earlier they now have one that's designed specific like an operating system that is open source that is designed to make your beagle bone into a handheld uh console like it's a, it's a portable nice. console like a game boy nice they call it the beagle boy and the implications of that and some of the weird legality uh and one thing we're definitely going to get into is um, ROMs, which are virtual versions of physical games. Mm -hmm. And uh, how Nintendo stole a ROM from the community. Which I'm sure you are you're you know about that. Yep. And so, uh, FPGAs and things like that. Yeah. How those are legally allowed and all that. Yep. So I think this is probably a good place to cut it. All right. Uh, about an hour 15. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you guys have anything you want to hear us talk about or you have any input on anything we've talked about, feel free to reach out. All of our stuff will be uh, linked. A lot of it's down below right now. Mm -hmm. our, our Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube are right down there. Um, yep. Our email is going to be put on the bio soon. Which we keep putting off, but I don't know why. But we have an email. Yeah, conversation quests at gmail.com obviously here on twitter or twitch it's twitch.tv slash conversation quests um facebook it's conversation quests and uh twitter is conversating quest essentially and that's again because of the character limit um 
my personal YouTube channel is Makes and Mods. Uh, come over, hang out. And I'm live here pretty much every day um, on Twitch over at Sin Schism. So feel free to check me out. I do gaming and uh, just have a chill time with a bunch of cool people. Yeah. Fun times over there for sure. All right. So uh, for now, I will catch you beautiful people. And AJ, we'll see you guys around. And uh, we'll be back next week. Uh, yep. Later.